Googlers and viewers tuning in. My name is Kayla and I am a group lead for Chicago's Asian Googler Network and the lead for the Midwest chapter of the Filipino Googler Network. I am honored to introduce both today's moderator and today's guest speaker, Naisha Arrington, starting with our host and BGN Chicago co-lead, Bijou Gervais. Raised in Miami, Florida and a proud Haitian American, Bijou has always found food to be the greatest connector of cultures. After graduating from Syracuse University, Bijou's love of the cold brought her to Chicago, where she started as a rotating account manager in our America Sales Associate Program, later moving on to become a permanent finance account manager. Since her start at Google, she has been an active member of the BGN community and constantly seeking opportunities to infuse her cultural upbringing into the office. With one such example being her kitchen sink event focused on making Haitian piquis, Bijou's love of food and its connection to our cultures led her and I to collaborate on this event, exploring the ways in which food not only feeds the soul, but is a recipe for connection. Which brings me to introducing who will be joining Bijou today, Chef Naisha Arrington. A California native born into a multi multicultural family, she is best known for her accomplishments as a chef and TV personality. Arrington has competed on season nine of Top Chef and most recently featured as a recurring judge on Chop Chopped Next Generation. Arrington was introduced to diverse culinary experiences at a young age, which has continually shaped her palate development and perspective of culture-informed cooking. A graduate of the Culinary School at the Art Institute of California in Los Angeles, Arrington forged her culinary career at Michelin-starred restaurants un under the direction from revered chefs, including Joelle Robuchon and Josiah Citron. Following her stints in kitchen, um, such as the Maison, Spice Mill, Melise, and the Wilshire, Arrington went on to open two proprietary concepts with Venice's beachside haven Leona in 2015 and Santa Monica's native in 2017, both placed on the late Jonathan Gold's iconic 101 Best Restaurants in Los Angeles. Arrington has been recognized as a rising star by James Beard Award-winning critic Brad Johnson, from Angeleno, Chef of the Year by Eater LA, and Zagat 30 Under 30, recipient in Los Angeles. Arrington has appeared as a contestant simultaneously on reality cooking shows Top Chef on Bravo and Chef Hunter on Food Network, winning both competitions. In 2013, she prevailed on Esquire Network's cooking competition show Knife Fight, then later returned as a guest chef judge. Current projects include YouTube series Plateworthy on Eater, which you should all watch, and she hosts. <laughs> Chef Naisha was featured as a recurring judge on Chopped Next Gen with Discovery Plus and will be on a judge, which I am guessing we'll talk about today, alongside Chef Gordon Ramsay on the forthcoming new show, Next Level Chef on Fox. Arrington's greatest enthusiasm will always be to champion her community and create food that hugs the soul. She continues to innovate and draw inspiration from her vibrant cultural background and French technique while upholding her mission to spread the message of love through food, using every plate as a new journey of discovery. Outside the kitchen, Arrington delights in spending time outdoors with her CrossFit family at the gym. The chef enjoys skateboarding alongside the Santa Monica bike path with her partner in crime, French bulldog Blue Ginger, and is a passionate proponent of the arts. If that didn't get you excited for today's talks at, I do not know what will. <laughs> Bijou, we are so excited to hear from Naisha. On over to you. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kayla. And as you read, you know, the accomplishments of Naisha, I just couldn't keep my jaw up. It's just so achieved and so accomplished. And we are really thrilled to have you here today um, and learn more about those accomplishments and really your journey. Um, and as Kayla mentioned in the beginning, you were exposed to diverse culinary experiences at an early age. Would you mind telling us more about what inspired your initial foray into cooking? Absolutely. And again, thank you, Kaylin. Thank you, Bijou. I'm honored to hold space and share this um, love language, essentially, through food. Um, yes, uh, my culinary career started at the young age of five years old. <laughs> um, no, I jokingly say that I've been training as a chef 
um, really since then because my grandmother was um, very, very passionate about teaching me life tools. She helped my parents raise me. And, um, you know, I think that sort of matriarch um, old school love, uh, she really was adamant on instilling life skills, you know, in me. And that for her was through the way of cooking. She, um, you know, she met my grandfather in the Korean War. Uh, my dad, my grandfather is a native Angelino and was stationed in Korea and met her. And um, so she taught me uh, diverse flavors. I was eating, you know, octopus and kimchi and um, making kimchi and uh, learning how to ferment when I was very, very young. So, um, you know, when I go to grandmother's house, my mom's mom, it was totally different dialogue on my dad's side. My dad's side's from Mississippi. Um, so going to my grandmother's house, I felt like there were moments of like stepping into another, um, you know, scene ultimately. I mean, un understanding a culture through food is, is so very powerful. So definitely, absolutely. Right. So it's so, uh, it, it, it totally infinitely has shaped my palate development. I just can totally remember those taste memories when I was a kid and um, standing next to her, learning how to blanch a vegetable or peel, you know, five pounds of garlic because she had to prep everything in bulk. Um, <laughs> they, those, those memories are what I am 100% on a constant pursuit to evoke in other people through my creations. Is that love? Yeah. I love that concept, you know, of how it transforms you and takes you to a new place, a new culture. Um, it allows you to experience something that you otherwise wouldn't have. Um, Absolutely. And, you know, transferring from Missis one household focus on like Mississippi cuisine, Southern cuisine, and then going to the other side of the pendulum and having Korean cooking. Um, and that sounds phenomenal. And I'd love to know, you know, how that cultural background inspired the dishes and the projects that you take on today. Yeah, that's a wonderful question, um, Bijou. You know, I think... First and foremost, I would say I'm a creative ultimately in the sort of macro lens in that um, I'm very right brain oriented. You know, I experience our world through texture, through color, through aroma, through our five senses. Um, yeah. And so for me being a chef, you know, I feel like I'm simply a conduit of mother nature and what she gives and that bounty that, uh, you know, our humanity, mankind coexists with the plant kingdom, with the animal kingdom. And ultimately those two kingdoms are what nurture our bodies, right? We live off of the earth. And so, you know, coming up, I, I'm a very like, um, how do I say this? Like I'm competitive, but in a good way, like I'm a very like <laughs> performance um, based person. Like I wake up at 5 a.m., you know, I work out five days a week. Like, you know, I grew up playing team sports. Like I am very um, performance driven, right? Like I am a very firm believer that our one life that we have, like make every day great, right? Like, and, and that's not to say that some days aren't great, right? We all have good days and bad days, but I think we all try to, I, I think it's important to live to the fullest, right? So um, coming up, I say that it, for context in that when I found my passion, which was always like synonymously living with me in tandem on my journey, like I grew up going to art school, I painted, I sculpted, um, I did photography, I was sewing, my mom was a seamstress, is a seamstress. And, um, you know, I found food as my love language. When I would come home from from elementary school, I would like, make soup for my friends and like invite them over and play restaurant when I was a little girl. I love and, that. I know. And like, it's so funny because when I first opened my first restaurant, Leona, you know, I come from a very blue collar family and um, my dad sat at my chef's table and I basically cooked him this sort of like omakase or tasting style menu. And he's never experienced that. Um, and I remember him looking around in that restaurant and was like, wow, Naisha, like you actually did the thing that you said you were going to do when you were a kid, you know, yeah. and that's food. So, but, you know, sort of rewinding, um, when I went to culinary school, they teach you in culinary school that, you know, French fine dining is the, is the most opulent, most elite, 
most, you know, North Star that you should attain is those Michelin stars, right? So that's what I set my life journey on when I was, I graduated culinary school in 2001. And I was like, I want to be the first everything, like, you know, because in my, in my field, like, you know, it was very like European male dominated. And now that dialogue starting to change. But when I was coming up, um, you know, I was in Michelin star kitchens, like you see on TV, you know, that depiction of like the crazy chaotic pan throwing, yelling chef, like flames and all the, I lived it. Exactly. The clanking, you can picture it, right? Exactly. Yeah. I lived that, you know, and uh, probably was like harder than it was on TV. Like I, it was very intense. Um, And so I say that in that I came up in French fine dining and that's what I've practiced. And Um, Over time, as a creative, I think that art is never truly finished. I think like the true artist is always evolving, always processing, always taking that life data and, you know, processing that and then sharing that with people. So I would say just more recently, like just this last um, public dinner dinner I did pre-shutdown, early, early, like January, 2020, um, was the first dinner I did where I truly drew inspiration from my culture, right? So Asian and African-American, and I use, I did my DNA test or whatever. So like found out I have roots in Nigeria, you know, that's a food and a culture that I have never really like tapped into as an African-American, you know, more than Mississippi, Southern side, gumbo, you know, biscuits and fried chicken, collard greens, all that kind of stuff I knew that was what I came up with. But Nigerian cuisine, native roots was something that I'd never really explored. So I did a dinner, you know, based off of nuances of that and just really took my life journey, you know, adapted techniques from my French classic training. So I I honor that. Um, And my progressive California cuisine uh, ethos is what I opened my restaurants as. I'm a native California and, and Angelino. Um, but so like dishes that were very exciting, like, um, braised oxtail and collard green dumplings, you know, um, I did this crudo of like, uh, tataki style fish where you basically just sear it over coals with like a very chilled pepper water and like a suya crumble, which is like a spice in Nigerian cuisine, but I made it this sort of large format. So delicious with like fried garlic and ginger and, uh, my mouth is watering as you're saying all of this. (laughs) It was amazing. Like the the guest feedback from that dinner was like impeccable. It was such a a tender, vulnerable moment. You know, I got on the mic and shared the dishes and the ethos and the. Like, I'm so, so grateful that I've found my calling in life because it it's like truly I haven't worked a day in my life. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it's challenging. Yes, it's stressful at times. Um, The food business is a uh, uh, interesting place uh, at times, but um, it's such a place of humble uh, offering to sh- nourish another person's body or, and say, here, this is my art, let it live in your soul. Because when we look at the plate as the canvas, that's consumed, you know, and that lives in your in your mind, you know, it, it lives in your memory bank and it doesn't live on a wall like other art forms, you know, so it's a, it's a very deep, um, connection that you can garner with the person whose product you're celebrating, whether that's, you know, a cow that gave their life or a, a sunflower plant or, you know, the artisan that made that plate, like all of those touch points are so, so, so special. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. my culture definitely influences my food. And I think it's a, a constant evolution for sure. No, I love that that concept of constant growth, but also putting yourself into your food in terms of like, you know, we're such multifaceted individuals and we have so many things that make up who we are. And to be able to share that with people in a way that's so personal um, is phenomenal. And just the idea of, you know, how when we eat, there are all these memories that are associated with like, I love Thanksgiving just because there's there's a sense of sitting together, this togetherness collective over food that's nourishing us with those that you love. Um, so hearing you speak that I'm like, of course, this is, this is your love language. And it's, it's beautiful to hear how you've been able to grow and infuse parts of you that you're learning about. Cause all of us are, are growing and learning more about ourselves. hundred percent. 
So if you had to think of a dish that would, you know, describe you, that you would want to serve to someone to be like, this is who I am or representative of me, what would that dish be? Well, <clears throat> I think that, so in 2019, I started to eat a lot more um, intentional, like more food as fuel, because I think coming up in fine dining, I mean, we're exposed to so much opulence of like cream and butter and, you know, all the things. It's like just all the opulent foods all the time. And I, and I um, forgot, you know, that we have to eat to nurture, nurture our bodies, not just eat for pleasure. So I think that when I started to really understand, you know, from a performance standpoint, eating more of a plant-based diet um, helped me just cognitively be able to connect, right? My, my, um, my cells. Um, I have now added a lot more uh, plant-based cooking into my repertoire, um, but I still definitely honor like where I came from, right? So something that I'm very passionate about is um, like soups and braises, like things that are slow cooking, long cooking, because I feel like Number one, they're always better the next day after they sit in the fridge and the flavors have had a chance to marry. And I also just like batch cooking. Like I'll make a big big batch of something on a Sunday and then like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday kind of just make variations of it. Like add wild rice or add chickpeas one day or add spinach and, you know, it tastes different every time. Um, but something I've become really passionate and um pretty good at is braising. So like, I like to slow cook and braise all kinds of things. Um, but one is, uh, I would say this dish probably embodies my whole repertoire the most. Um, so my grandmother's name's Isoon, and um, she would always make this condiment, um, kind of like a dinjang, kind of like soy, soy with like um, fermented chili paste and like scallions and sesame. It's this delicious kind of um, sauce. And so I took my kind of French classic cuisine teachings of braising and I put the two together. So I did this like braised short rib dish um, and they wrote about it in the LA Times and it was like a very mm -hmm. highly acclaimed dish. Um, and so then I was serving it with this like bone marrow roasted potatoes, but now I serve it with um, these kind of sweet potato grits. So it's kind of like mm -hmm. roasting sweet potatoes because they're really good for you. And then I fold that into um, like heirloom grits and then kind of put the braised short rib on top and the beautiful jus and um, some beautiful like watercress. Um, there's an episode I did on um, the kitchen on Food Network. If anyone wants to like see that recipe or have it, it's really freaking amazing. Um, so I would say that's probably the dish that embodies like everything of my life journey so far. Oh my goodness. I'm definitely going to watch that video. I'm yeah. nowhere near to the culinary needs where I probably need to be, but I definitely want to attempt that like grits with sweet potatoes sounds so good. And I yeah. very easy, it. very delicious. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. I think, you know, I love hearing about the importance of nature and how that also nourishes us. And speaking of plant-based diet, like I'm a pescatarian. So hearing you speak about that, I was like, yes, there are so many things that come from the ground that we just overlook that consistency yes. um, and take the nutrients from the soil and really, you know, give us the nutrients we need. Um, so it's incredible to hear how you infuse that, you know, mentality into your cooking. Um, and I know along your career journey, you've obviously been trained in the traditional sense and then trained by your grandmother and learned different ways. Um, and it sounds like you've had a lot of important people in your life. Um, so would love to hear, you know, about the people who really influenced you and who you would consider a mentor for you as you've explored your, your culinary career? Well, thank you for that question. It's a very personal question um, in that I value these people greatly. You know, I, um, I think it's interesting in any degree of success. You know, sometimes people look at that as a, a touch point of envy and say, oh, wow, they're so lucky or look at what they're doing. And it's like, the reality is that, iceberg like under there's so much that has happened right that root system of mentorship of people that have opened doors of people that have taught you life skills of people that were telling you you're doing it the wrong way or you know that's valuable as well um through the failures through the through the successes um 
it's all part of the journey. I think that ultimately I've had uh, many mentors in my life, you know, ones of fitness, of business, of um, life coaching, um, and all of them have played very important roles in, in, in me becoming who I am. Um, but I have to say, because there's like, you know, a few names swirling around and I want to pay homage to a couple, but um, Josiah Citroen, he's definitely the person who taught me the most about cooking. He's a two-star Michelin chef in Santa Monica, where I live currently. Um, and I've opened two restaurants with him. So I, I definitely think he has been um, a mentor that has stood out in my life. Definitely Marcus Samuelson. He then taught me a lot about business and marketing. And um, he's a chef as well, globally recognized chef. Um, but I would have to say the most important person in my life has been my dad. My dad has been my biggest supporter, uh, my uh, best friend, my like everything. And um, he's definitely the person has supported me the most um, through my crazy adventures in life. I've lived all over this globe and he, I, I think it makes him nervous. Like every time I get on a plane, but like, you know, <laughs> I have big dreams and I want to get out there in the world. And um, ultimately, you know, I just want to be able to support them at some point in my life. You know, my parents, you know, as our parents get older and the legacy continues through the generations of ancestors into the new world, um, you know, I think family is so very important. And so I think everything that drives my success is because of my family. Of course, my mom is important to me. Of course, my sister is. But my dad, he really just has this universal perspective on life that is so, um, you just, I just haven't personally come across it a lot in um in some, you know, cast of characters that have entered my life. And he's truly a hero. He's like an unsung superhero. And like, if I get the chance to like tell his story one day, I will, because he's just an impeccable human, not just to me, but just like everyone is an awesome person. Oh, I love that. I'm definitely a daddy's girl as well. And yeah. about your dad, I'm like, oh, I miss my dad. I'm like, oh. yeah, <laughs> yes. But I love how you spoke about, you know, the different people in your lives. And I think we all have mentors that serve different purposes um, that either help you technically or emotionally or on a business front. Um, so hearing about that is so phenomenal because it obviously made you the well-rounded individual you are. Um, and would love to hear from you, what really makes a successful mentor? Like of your experience of all the mentors you've had, what really made them strong and, and memorable for you? Wow. So, you know, I have to say, um, I don't know if there's like younger generation people listening or not, but I would say the most difficult part, okay, no, like the most important part of mentorship is um, telling people when they're wrong, you know, and, and I think sometimes mentorship can be like people maybe have this conception in their mind of like, you know, you're just putting in your work and, you know, you're maybe making some connections and you're building your network and like that's what mentorship is. But I think mentorship is also um, putting yourself second and just doing the work, you know, it is very important. I think, um, you know, I have a pretty good work ethic. And I think that ultimately above anything else has opened the doors for me uh, is just putting in the freaking work. And I think um, what is important about mentorship from a uh, mentee mentor uh, relationship is if you, you're mentoring multiple people is to mentor based on the individual, because I think that everyone receives and perceives information differently on any given day. I mean, humans are complex creatures, you know? So I think that the ability to um, communicate effectively based on the individual so that the information is retained is, um, is very, very, very important. I think that um, that above networking, opening doors, all that's great, that'll come with hard work, but the ability to truly effectively communicate uh, is good, you know? And um, I think sometimes, like for me, I can only speak from my experience, you know, um, like when I say telling people when they're wrong versus right, I think um, it's not just like a, an award for showing up is not enough, you know? I think true um, character building comes to the strife, you know? And I think working in those kitchens has definitely garnered me a thick skin. Um, 
you know, you have to like be able to put up with so much. Um, so it's funny because like I'm just like playing frames of like scenes in my mind throughout my lifetime as I'm like saying these words. So it's like super cool to kind of have this full circle moment to like talk about, you know, mentorship because um, it always, it hasn't always been an easy road, you know, it's an uphill climb. And I think that mentor mentee relationship is something that's very special and it has to be held sacred. Yeah, definitely. I love the piece on, you know, getting that hard feedback. I think it's sometimes hard and it has to come from someone that you trust and knows has your best interest at mind. Cause if not, it feels very attacky or, you know, just in that sense, you can get defensive and the way totally. that you deliver everything. Totally. totally. Yeah. I, I love that. And I think it's important for all of us to think about as we have mentors in our life and how we receive feedback and how we give it. Um, I'll be honest, you know, I've been on both sides of the coin, you know, because leadership is something that, um, I mean, not everyone's born with, maybe some people are, but for me, I've always been a person who likes to play on a team, right? And I like to inspire people, but, you know, coming up in this sort of heavy handed um, place of the kitchen, I definitely led like that at times too, you know, and, and understanding how to truly communicate and effectively communicate with people as a skill that I've had to uh, exercise, right? Put in the reps, see what works, what doesn't work, how certain people based off of their life journey are receiving the information. And it's this constant um, muscle that has to be nurtured, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think speaking of that, like what was kind of the biggest challenge for you as you navigated your way through through the kitchen? Well, I mean, to be honest, first and foremost, it's not that easy to be a woman of color, to have a leadership position. I think, especially for me coming up in the earlier stages of my life, I uh, was the youngest person in the kitchen, nine times out of 10. Coming back to that performance standpoint, I was like, I feel like I'm always um, have this sense of urgency of time, right? Because that's our truly non-renewable -renew resource is our lifetime, right? So I, I think just from the moment I graduated high school, even I was like, okay, like, let's go. I got to get, get my career on the move. Right. So I think, um, you know, just being able to have the mindset to diligently uh, work at the things I was not great at and sort of um, nurture and celebrate the things I was good at, you know, and I think um, it was through, um, how do I say, like, we call him a clipboard chef. Like I did, I never wanted to be a clipboard chef, just like stand in the corner and write my little notes. Like I'm a person that's like very tactile. I get in there, I lead by example. And, um, you know, I think that's ultimately in the early stages of my like leadership where I was like, you know, young, the youngest person in the kitchen where I'm like commanding these, like, you know, people that have been in the game for 20 years, you know, how do I get them to respect me? You know, like it was, definitely trial and error, but ultimately I think, um, it was about putting in the work, you know? Yeah. I think yeah. as you forge your own path, cause a lot of us have, you know, mentors and they influence how we are, but then we have to take our own spin on how we're going to do things. Um, and so, you know, you obviously being one of the youngest and a black female navigating a space that others have not, um, is incredible and just, a, a testament to your, your strength and ability to, to navigate these unknown spaces. Um, and as you spoke yeah. about leadership style, I would love to know, how do you think others would describe your leadership style in the kitchen? I would say it depends on which era of Naisha. You no, we'll walk us through. <laughs> to be honest. Okay. So like in 2008, I was just coming out of like, you know, so call it almost 10 years, right? Of like my Michelin training. And back then it's like, pre Me Too movement. This is pre talks of inclusion. This is, you know, pre like woke era. So it was like little Naisha in the kitchens, like dealing with a lot of BS, you know? Um, and then, you know, getting my first um, kitchen, so to speak, you know, I was definitely like a yelling chef, like, <laughs> like, like if someone messed something up, I would be like very insulted, like, like take it personal, like, you are literally trying to upset me and let them know. Um, I remember specifically um, one night when this gentleman, I fired him that night and um, he came up to me with this burned protein 
And like in a kitchen, it's a brigade, right? So like if, if I'm the orchestrator uh, in the kitchen, you're waiting on veg station, you're waiting on fish station, you're waiting on meat station, salad station, and the orchestrator is bringing all of that together. That's an art in itself in a dance, you know, two minutes on fish, drop your vegetable, sauce that chicken, whatever. And so when the meat person came up and, you know, the whole table's ready to go, he came up with a burned um, salmon, I think it was, and then had the audacity to, to tell me, oh, I think it's okay. Like, do you think like, and, and I was so upset. Like I took the pan out of his hand and threw it into the dish station, not like at anyone. Yeah. Um, <laughs> although I've witnessed that quite often. Um, I threw the pan in the dish station and I was like, get, you know, expletive, expletive, expletive. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then I cooked his station um, the rest of the night and show, showed the rest of the team how it was done. Not, not out of an ego sense, but, um, you know, that's a more of a wild side because I remember how I felt and I was so livid um, because that person didn't understand how important you know, or didn't take it was right for themselves. Like ultimately I'm always like, do you see that this is black? It's like, how can you think <laughs> that this is okay? Like you need to stop cooking if you think that this taste it like, you know, like I just, so um, that <laughs> early on <laughs> fast forward 10, 15 years later, lots of trial and error. Um, you know, I call my style, I would say uh, love leadership. Right. Because I think that ultimately you want to teach people to love what their craft is because they're going to give you the best. Right. Yeah. If angry cook is making that broccoli, you're going to taste angry broccoli. If someone was like, oh, I love this broccoli. Like I'm going to put this lemon zest in here and then I taste it and then it needs a little bit of pepper. It needs a little salt. Oh, the broccoli spicy today. It doesn't need the pepper. You know, it's not just on autopilot. Like cooking is an art that person's going to taste that. You know, there was one person, I remember this person flew from state, a different state to fly and have dinner. And I walked by it. They were sitting on table 14 and she looked a little like despondent or concerned. And I was like, are you enjoying your meal? Thank you for coming. And she looked up at me and a tear like fell out of her eye. And she was like, you don't understand. Like I came here from Texas, flew to this restaurant to experience this and it has superseded my expectations because I feel the hug through this dish. And like, ultimately like that is my goal, right? Like that, I, I if I could do that for the rest of my life, I feel I would live a fulfilled life, right? Because I think when we look back on our taste memories, we're always like thinking like what ignited our soul, you know? And that could be like a work accolade celebration, eating dinner with your dad or Thanksgiving. Like we always, I feel like food is always like this celebratory thing, you know? Yeah. And I think it's, you know, around us and we in, in, ingest it so often like with others and with people. So it's definitely like a, it's a cultural moment. Um, and I think, you know, hearing the evolution of your style just shows to your growth of we all start at one point And I mean, I can, I feel like the anger of like someone giving me a burnt salmon being like, it's fine. Like, and then how you evolve to that and understand like, okay, this is what I'm not going to deal with. Or like, here's how I'm going to present this of like, what you put on a plate should be a reflection of your sentiment and of your love as you give it to others. So just great to hear how you've changed and evolved. And I'm sure you've had some, some wild kitchen stories. Um, so nice to see how you've woven in different parts of that into who, who you are and how you lead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I know we're almost to the audience questions, so just a couple more questions. But, you know, as Kayla listed your accolades and many accomplishments, you've done so much um, and pivoted, you know, outside of the kitchen as well. So we yes. to understand, you know, as you continue to grow, you know, away from the stove, what do you think is some advice you can give to others as they look to diversify or to pivot outside of what they, they do currently? Wow, great question. Um, I think it's important to always diversify your portfolio. I don't know. I think that's what the adults say. Um, <laughs> but I think it's important because we're multifaceted people. You know, I think for me, I can, when I look at my tree trunk, I'm like, okay, I have a fitness branch, you know, I have a business branch, I have 
you know, my food and all those things I can like tap into based off of how I feel. Right. Like, and so I think that especially in the digital age that we're in, you know, small businesses are more easy to cultivate than ever. And I think that whether your passion project is the thing that gains you monetary value for your life or it doesn't, like it's still important for your soul to be able to, you know, go to your job, do your things well, but also have things on the back burner. You know, that's kind of always how my life has been is not that I don't believe in plan A. It's just that A, B, and C can also work in tandem, right? My art, right? I just sold my first piece of art um, last week. Um, Congratulations. That's incredible. I love how you're so multifaceted and just have all these, you know, spinning plates, if you want. (laughs) Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, we sold it and um, donated the proceeds to Restaurant Cares, which is a nonprofit that um, is helping families, right? Because restaurants uh, were the first thing. I mean, lots of different verticals, but restaurants really got hit hard um, through the pandemic. So we were happy to support Restaurant Cares and the families that are associated with that nonprofit. Um, But I think, yeah, I think it's important to have things that make you happy, right? I think that all, I mean, yes, it would be nice if our jobs were the place where we can like find our family and like, you know, but that's not always the case. So I think it's important to diversify and like, you know, do the art, do the fitness, do the food things, like put out a sauce line. Like those are things that make, that fill my soul, right? And it's not in a chaotic way. I think it's in a um, intentional way of like, you can have your plan A, but still cultivate the others so that, you know, five to 10 years, you're like, oh yeah, I've been kind of putting a a couple things in that. And now all of a sudden it's whole, you know, and you have this other project that you can present the world. Um, Yeah. So I think evolution is, is very important. Yeah. I think that ability to, to cultivate all the different pieces um, and have it be representative of who you are is great. And as I try to think about, you know, what's my next venture, what are other parts of myself that I haven't explored because you know, we spend so much time at work, but there are other parts of ourselves that we need to explore. Absolutely. Um, So definitely very inspiring as I think about, you know, what does the future look like in 10 years? What will I say I've done? Um, Yeah. I know you have a show coming up as one of your many ventures that you're, you're doing. Would you mind just telling us more about the, the upcoming show? Oh, I would love to be you. I'm very proud of it. Um, So it's, the show is called next level chef NLC. And um, it's going to be on Fox. And we just wrapped filming about a month ago. Um, It's a mentorship based cooking competition. So as a person who's been in many cooking competitions, who, um, like I said, I'm very competitive, (laughs) but like, (laughs) I think it's, this is such a cool format that I was so honored to be a part of. So I went on Gordon Ramsay's show called uh, Master Chef, and I did a cooking demo for the finalists and they were tasked to recreate the dish that I demoed. And essentially when I walked off the set, Gordon came out and was like, and shook my hand and was like, who are you? And I told him about myself and things. And he's like, we should keep in contact. And then a few months later, and I'm thinking, yeah, I'll never hear from this guy again. And the, his people reached out and said, hey, we have this um, amazing new concept for a show, Next Level Chef. And they told me about it, uh, the executive producer, Matt Cahoon. And we talked it through and um, he said, you know, when you came on Master Chef, we were very, um, you know, delighted with you and whatnot. And um, we think that this would resonate with you being the mentorship uh, component of it. And um, it definitely did. And it's so exciting. I cannot wait till people see it because it's like, it's like, I mean, it's called Next Level Chef, but it's truly next level. And I'm not just saying that on the show. If I wasn't <laughs> on it, I would be super excited to, as a food person, right? And, and as a person who loves to communicate through media. Um, so the the kitchen, it's actually kind of like, is imagine if you were like, if you dissected a kitchen and you sort of like cut it in half, like that's the view that the viewer is getting. So we basically stacked three kitchens on top of each other. There's a first level basement kitchen, there's a mid-level kind of working kitchen, and there's a top-level kitchen that's like the elite three-star Michelin kitchen. And our teams of five, myself, Richard, and Gordon, uh, we mentor teams of five. 
And we're ultimately trying to get our people to win, you know, and, and be there for them, and, which is so beautiful because in cooking competitions I was in, you don't know what you're doing. You're just like, I'm here to cook and you, and you just try your best, you know, to have that element of mentorship is great. And so um, we just announced last week that it's premiering uh, January 2nd. So Hooray! mark your calendars. Yes. Yeah, I know. It's like the biggest platform and stage that I've been on. So like, I'm personally very like, um, how do I say like grateful, honored, like, um, you know, I'm just excited. And um, yeah, so I hope you guys all watch it. It's called Next Level Chef January 2nd. And yeah, the chefs are amazing. Um, so just it, to be like an intersection in their lives, you know, because yes, we want our individual teams to win, but you get a chance to really connect with, you know, 15 human beings that all have a story to tell. And like, you know, I'm just a blip on their journey, but like, you know, it just fills my cup to like connect and, you know, like there's some amazing episodes of like people just like crying and it's like, I'm, you know, just like all the, all the feels it's like really, it's fiery at times, like, but it's exciting. It seems yeah. like it, it's going to explore, you know, the full range of like the human experience in terms of like, there are really high highs and connection and then there's lows and yes. knowing that you have people there that are going through it with you, that yes. guide you. Yes. Um, I'm so excited for the show. I cannot wait to watch it. And I know just talking to you, I, I know it's going to be great. So I'm really, really looking forward to it. Um, so just one last question before we open it up to the audience, but would love to hear if there's anything else you want to plug. I know you're working on multiple things. So anything you want everyone to know about, to check out, to buy, to look on their calendar for um, before we move to audience questions. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, what do I want to say? I'm doing all things. Uh, well, what can I say? I mean, I'm working on a sauce that is on the back burner. It's not like available to the public yet, but it will be soon. I'll just tell you guys the exclusive. Um, but it's the ice soon sauce I mentioned earlier that it's kind of like a dressing, a soup base. You kind of just add it to whatever you want to have a little bit of love and ice soon in. Um, A-I-S-O-O-N is how I spelled my grandmother's name. Um, but that'll be out um, at some point. <laughs> um, what else? I am also a judge on Top Chef. That should come out at some point next year. Um, and what else can I say? I'm excited for the holidays. I'm going to have my parents over and make some holiday magic food happen here. Um I don't know. That's it. I would just say, keep a lookout for me. I am like, no plans on slowing down and um, just happy and honored to share my love of cooking with people. Yeah. I know Kayla and I are official fangirls, so we are following closely. So when that sauce drops, let us know. We'll buy a yeah. bunch, give it to the members of AGN and VGN. Um, yes. But we're well, actually, um, I'm doing an immersive uh, trip to Oaxaca with like 15 people. So I'll probably post it on my Insta. If people like want to come, you should come because I'm doing one in Morocco in May of 2022. And we have like 15 people coming, I'm going to go to Morocco. I'm probably going to like extend the trip and like go to like other parts of the continent yeah. and explore, which I'm very excited about because I haven't been. Um, so that's something to look forward to in the new year. Also, I'm going to be hosting, um, New Year's Eve in Times Square uh, for <laughs> um, for the new year. So it's going to be on Fox as well. Definitely look out for that. That's amazing. I know. You, you're like one of the coolest people I've talked to in like forever. <laughs> I'm, oh, I'm so, <laughs> so honored to just be on this call with you. Um, and thank you for sharing, you know, something that's so close and personal to you, something that is your love language. I think we've all learned so much about, you know, the range of food, what it can represent, what it can mean, um, and how it can be representative of different people and their intersectionality and their identities. Um, so just loved having this conversation. Um, so now we will turn it over to um, comments and questions from the audience. Oh, nice. Perfect. So the first question is from Jason. 
So it says, hi, Chef Naisha. Thanks for being a part of Google Talks. My wife loves bitter melon. I don't. Have you cooked with the interesting veggie and how do you make it taste good? Wow, what a great question. Um, how do I answer this? I honestly don't love bitter melon also. <laughs> Jason, I, I mean, that's, I don't know. I can't lie and be like, oh, this is how you make it taste good. It's not like for me, but um, a lot of people sort of salt it to help that bitter flavor come out. Um, but it's not something I use like on an everyday basis. I think that's fair. <laughs> Awesome. The next question is from Caitlin. So it goes, hi, Chef Naisha. Thanks for joining us. What is the most recent new ingredient or flavor combination that surprised you? Wow. Wonderful question. Um, and thanks for having me as well. Hmm. A new flavor combination. Interesting. I need to think. I'm like, what's new? I'm going to put a pin in it and think about it for a second. That's fair. Um, next question is from Carolyn. Hi, Chef Naisha. As we've been working from home, I find myself just getting by with lazy quick meals. What is your go-to lazy quick meal? Oh my gosh, I know. It's so interesting. A lot of people that I've spoken with um, are like, oh my God, now I'm trained to order food and like I've been cooking last. Um, for me, I'm a big like one pot person. So I tend to make for example, like right now I have chickpeas soaking in my fridge and I'll probably make, I'll just like chop up some mirepoix, so carrot, onion, celery, roast that, put my chickpeas in, tomato paste, coconut milk, some veggie broth, and I just let that stew and like the vegetables sort of thicken that. And then um, over the time, like I might serve that with quinoa one day or the next day add a little bit of like lemon zest and you know or curry powder and it's like a completely different dish so if i feel like i have a huge like huge calendar or busy schedule i try to make like one dish and then make variations of it over um a few days like if you want to add you know chopped chicken breast or use it as a sauce or or blend that same soup base okay. that's a great way to like make one thing and then you just like can make variations based off of that that makes sense um that's yeah. how I kind of navigate time. I think that's a great idea because I always find myself just making either like the same salad and then it gets boring yeah. or sandwich. So I love, you know, the idea that you gave there. Yeah. Awesome. I think we have time for two more questions. So the next one's from Lexi. Um, being asked to include a new or an unexpected ingredient probably fuels your creative creativity. But what about being asked to remove flavors or ingredients either from religious exemptions or allergies, how do you approach that? Okay, so I have to be honest, I completely respect it because as I mentioned, um, 2019, you know, I found it was so hard for me. Like I had to actually break my um, alkaline eating habits because I was in Hong Kong and like they don't really use a lot of like vegetable-based um, like fats. Like I would find like, if I got even a side of sauteed vegetables, it'd be sauteed in pork fat or something like that. So um, I'm very sensitive to food allergies and food preferences, and I completely respect them. Um, how do I navigate them? I um, I tend to be very conscious about um, how food affects the body as fuel anyways. So like particular oils that have like carcinogens in them, I don't use, you know, um, if someone's not eating animal proteins, like I totally respect that. And I personally have made it my, you know, sort of due diligence to go in and educate myself um, and actually plan on, um, you know, taking some nutrition classes also, because I think that in this day and age, you know, if we're not honoring those things, then, um, you know, it's really kind of irresponsible. I think back in the day, 10, 20 years ago, it was a less of a dialogue, you know, it was kind of like, yeah. people were made to feel that, it was a um, inconvenience at times. So um, no, I totally honor and respect food allergies and, and adapt well to them. I actually just, I mostly try to create my menus, to be honest, in a way that is appealing to, to all people, you know, 
Um, ultimately, you know, if you're celiac or you have an allergic allergy to nightshades, like, you know, we can work around that. But I try to be conscious when I'm creating my menu. I, I try to cater to all types of people. So they tend to be gluten free. They tend to not be salted heavily. Just very intentional. Yeah, I think that that sounds amazing of like, you know, when you make it from its base, coming with it in an inclusive mindset of how it can, you know, factor in and work for other people. Um, totally. So that's great. Um, perfect. Next question from Tanya. So she loved you on Tournament of Champions. Aww. How do you come up with ideas for dishes so quickly when given a random set of ingredients and a short amount of time? Oh my gosh. I love this question, Tanya. Like, thank you. First of all, like I, that cooking competition was probably the most fun cooking competition I've done today. I would say Top Chef was the most stressful. Um, okay. So how do I explain this? Like literally like there's this thing called, for those who haven't seen it, there's something called the randomizer and like it rolls and then you get like, you know, five random things and you have to make a dish. And it's like, so freaking hard. And it's such a, um, how do I say it? It's such an exercise of, of mindset because the reality is you're like, you know, you're on a freeway, like in your mind, your mind's going one way and you're like, okay, I have this, I, I got uh, cheese or whatever. So you're like, okay, I'm gonna make a cheese sauce. And then you're like looking around the kitchen seeing if you can actually make, do all the things. And you try to like map out. I always say like, the North star, and then you like reverse engineer your plan. So it's like, okay, I see this pan. I'm going to go grab that first. And then I'm going to go grab the whisk because it's over here. And then on the way back and you literally try to map out like what your plan is in tandem of like thinking about all the ingredients you need to grab. So it's like, just like walk through that first five minutes of chaos in your mind that you're trying to organize. Um, it's not easy. First of all, it's a skill. <laughs> and <laughs> I mean, it is because you have to think like you're using like hot pans and sharp knives and to like even think through and also make your knife cuts perfect is challenge in itself, you know? And that's why I love that mentorship based show. It's like, no, are you sure you really want to like grab that cayenne pepper bottle and just pour it in as opposed to just like pinch it and, you know, because you run the risk of like all of it falling in. And then like in those shows, it's like, or those competitions, you there you just, there's not a lot of times you get a second chance. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's something that for some weird reason, I kind of thrive off of the intensity of it, um, but I love it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging. I don't know, how do you come up with them? It's just like, whatever, for some reason, like you just like, you know, you just kind of put all the data in your mind and whatever comes out, it's like, just stick <laughs> with that plan, you know? Um, which was so freaking fun. Um, yeah, but I would say like in terms of the question earlier, I'm definitely, I don't know if I can limit it, it down to like particular ingredients. I would say it's just like sweet and savory is kind of like my favorite, uh, flavor combination. Like for example, I did this salad. Um, it's, you can call it a salad, but really it's just a beautiful melange of vegetables. Um, I was in Wisconsin last, a couple days ago for um, a food event. And my for my course, I did this roasted delicata squash because that's what mother nature is giving us right now. And it's a very short season. I highly suggest if you guys haven't had delicata squash, definitely try it. Um, it's a squash that you can roast. It's probably about this big and you can leave the skin on. So for me, that works because it's not a lot of prep. I hate like I, I shouldn't say hate, like, I just don't love like spending a lot of time prepping, like doing veg. It's like, there's got to be a efficient, delicious way to make food. Right. So I try to source ingredients that way. Um, but delicata squash is amazing. You can literally just cut it open. You can roast the seeds. So that's totally what we did. I like I'm a big proponent for using byproduct, right? So you get those squash seeds, you roast them. And as opposed to like, you know, roasting croutons, for, for your salad that add texture, we're using those already, the squash seed, seeds that are inside that gives us amazing crunch and flavor and mm -hmm. echoes those kind of squash flavors in, in a different way. Um, and then I, I did this like pomegranate vinaigrette with like, um, you know, pickled shallots and uh, I did shaved roasted cauliflower, 
uh, herb salad and, and dried cherries. So point being like, it was exciting to eat. Like you had this second course of like delicious, beautiful vegetables, but you're eating it. And then you have like savory and then you get like a dried cherry. And it's like that flavor combination is freaking amazing. Um, and I feel like that's one of the things that are like indicative of California cuisine. I think that we are able to mix savory and sweet, like not a lot of continents. Um, like I've seen that we do from like a um, produce perspective. Um, so I would say that's like my favorite combo. Good to know. Yeah. I love salty sweet. It's controversial, but I also do like pineapple on pizza. I won't start <laughs> off a barrage of comments, but yes. <laughs> I'm a fan. Yeah. Um, awesome. I think we have time for one more question. Oh, um, I like it. So, oh, I think you just answered that one, the, the combination. Um, let's see what the last one will be. This is fun. So the last one is, you know, what are, and this is from Sydney, what are some of your favorite restaurants to dine at? Ooh, um, honestly, uh, I've been... So, I mean, I have a huge like spectrum. I, um, but I'm going to say this because it hits my soul. Um, I love breakfast places and, you know, I here in my home, like, of course I try to eat, you know, breakfast as fuel, like a smoothie or whatever, um, things like that. I don't eat a lot in the morning, but I would say when I was growing up, Saturday and Sunday mornings were like, my fondest memories because my dad would always be playing some kind of like funk music or, or like awesome or soul train was on or something just it was like such a good vibe and then like my mom would be like okay we have to like clean the whole house so like saturday and sunday for some reason that's what me and my sister had to do which is fine um but she would always make a really bomb breakfast and like with all the things you know, like pancakes bacon and grits and eggs and and i just remember waking up to those smells um, and that's what I think about like balance, right. And being multifaceted. It's not like you have to eat healthy all the time for brain optimization and function. I think, um, soul fitness is good too, you know? So if you like put those things in, you know, you feel good and you have those taste memories, it's important. So I would say when it, to eat out breakfast places are like my favorite, particularly there's a place called the serving spoon, um, here in Los Angeles which is amazing. And um, that place, it feeds my soul like no other. Um, and I think, yeah, it's just like to be able to sit down and have an amazing breakfast is um, awesome. Because, I mean, I've eaten at some of the best restaurants in the world in like Lyon, France, and um, in Peru, I ate at one of the top 50 best restaurants in the world. Like I've done all that and that's all amazing, right? But like, I just think the way that um, uh, awesome breakfast, you know, hits my soul, it takes me back to my childhood. So that's my answer. I am always there for like a short stack of pancakes with oh. whatever my other meal is. I'm like, yes, you're basically eating cake for breakfast. It's, like, I, oh, it's <laughs> perfect. <laughs> oh. Well, I think that was the perfect note to end on. I'm maybe going to make breakfast for lunch <laughs> after this. We'll see. Here for um, it. But thank you so much for taking the time to join us. This has been honestly such an amazing conversation to just hear from you, learn from your experiences, also be inspired from your experiences in terms of how we can, you know, better our cooking ability um, and share share our love of food with others. So thank you so much. I know, I don't know if Kayla's still on, but her and I are just, you know, honestly thrilled to have you. And it's been phenomenal talking with you. Yeah, I appreciate um, these types of moments where you just get to sit still and connect with people. And, and you know, there's an audience who's engaged. And um, this is really what life's about, I think, you know. So I appreciate um, you guys holding space for me. Um, if you are interested, uh, my social is at Naisha Joyce. So it's my first name, N-Y-E-S-H-A. And then Joyce is my middle name. And that's my Instagram, my Twitter I'm also on Cameo, birthday shout out. Um, and don't forget to follow the journey and watch Next Level Chef because, um, yeah, it's important. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. It's been a phenomenal Talks at Conversation. Thank you.